Chapter 12, Revelation. Father, we settle our hearts. We thank you for your word. <clears throat> Father, we do pray that as we study uh, Satan and what's coming. Lord, some terrible things are coming, but at the end of the day, you're going to deal with them. And so for that, we can rejoice. And Lord, we don't always understand why you allow things to play out the way they do. But we know that your ways are right and they're true and they're holy. And so, Father, may we just increase our faith to stand in these last days, not be deceived, and to help turn many to righteousness, to the truth in Jesus. Thank you for these things. Please open your word to us now afresh. Lord, just put a word in my mouth for this service that they might be ministered to and encouraged, but also edified and equipped. Please be here with us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 11, verse 15. Again, the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Question. Are the kingdoms of this world now in submission to him? No. So how's he going to get them in submission to him? You've got to come and deal with them, Right? Who's behind the governments today? What power is directing many of the nations and things going on? Demonic activity. So if you're going to deal with the earthly kingdoms, first you've got to deal with the spiritual stronghold that's against them. So chapter 11, verse 15 kind of sets it up for us what's happening. We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, verse 17, which art and was and art to come, because you've taken to you your great power and you've reigned. And so the nations were angry, your wrath has come, the time of the dead, that they should be judged. That thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, that should destroy them which destroy the earth. And interestingly enough, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Apparently that's unusual. It's now opened. And the ark of his testament, or his covenant, was seen. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake. Now, we didn't have Wednesday night with Joshua crossing the Jordan, so we have to wait till this coming Wednesday night, God willing. But when God begins to take them into the promised land, when Israel comes in as God's rod of correction against the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the otherites, as he sends them in to deal with their moral failures and to bring his judgment against them, interestingly enough, just before he begins to bring them into his, his dominion, he reveals the Ark of the Covenant. Normally, when the tabernacle moves, if you were with us through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all that in Deuteronomy, normally the priest would go in, grab the veil, cover the Ark, then cover it with badger skins, then cover it with a blue cloth so that the Kohathites would know this is the Ark of the Covenant, treat it carefully, and then they would come pick it up and they would begin to transport the Ark. It would be transported, covered, and different than any other piece of furniture with the blue cloth exposed. So they would know this is the Ark, be careful. But when they cross the Jordan, God does something unusual. He allows Joshua and the armies to have the priest take the ark and to show it before all of them, as well as whatever lookouts Jericho had watching them cross over. So the ark is revealed as he goes in and begins to deal with and conquer those enemies in his judgment against their moral failures. Interestingly enough, we get into Revelation chapter 12 here. Verse 15, we've got the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of our Lord. Chapter 11, verse 19 there, chapter 11, the ark is revealed. Chapter 12, war breaks out. And God begins to take conquest of these things. Very interesting, the parallel. So chapter 12, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of 12 stars. Who's this? What book do you need to understand verse 1 of chapter 12? A commentary on Revelation. No. What book of the Bible do you need to understand verse 1 of chapter 12? The book of Genesis. What do you mean? Joseph had a dream. First dream he said to his brothers, crazy thing happened. I had this dream. We're out binding sheaves and my sheaf stood up and all your sheaves came down and bowed to my sheaf and did obeisance. And it was just crazy. And I woke up and they said, you're going to rule over us? I don't think so. And they hated him because of it. A little, uh, little while longer, he's prepared of God that they should. Interesting. This time the 11 stars and the sun and the moon came down and bowed down to me. I just wonder what it means. They hated him. 
And Jacob said, we think as though Satan's going to overwhelm him to bow down to you. So now take that dream from Genesis 37. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. What does it represent? Israel. Well, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, I've heard people say this represents Mary. It doesn't fit as we work through the chapter. You'll see why. It's Israel. And from Israel would come the tribe of Judah. From the tribe of Judah would come the family of David. From David would come the Messiah. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven horns, denoting power, dominion. Ten, or seven heads, sorry, dominion, power, intelligence. Ten horns, we'll speak of those ten kings or the Antichrist soon enough, we'll get into that, rule, diversified. Seven crowns, speaking of rule or dominion, complete dominion. And this world has been under his dominion. He's the God of this age, it tells us in Corinthians. But his time is coming to an end. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So there's this this vision of, of Israel and Satan seeking to attack it. Interestingly enough, in all this activity, his tail draws with him one third of the stars of heaven. We'll need that in a minute. Depart from you, workers of angels. Cast them to the earth, and he's ready to devour her child as soon as it was born. What defend this? Once again, Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord said to Eve and to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed and between the serpent and his seed. Israel will bring forth a man-child. Behold, a virgin will be with child. We'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And Satan is going to bruise his heel. Where? On the cross. But the seed of the woman is going to crush his head. Death and resurrection of Christ has purchased us back from sin. He's redeemed the earth. And now he's going to claim it. And so he was seeking to devour her male child as soon as it was born. And there are many examples of Satan trying to do this in the past. Herod, for example, diligently inquired of the wise men. Go and worship the king, and when you've worshipped him, come and bring me word that I may worship him also. The wise men were warned by the Lord to go home a different way. So Herod sent out his men and destroyed through all the territories of Bethlehem, two years old and younger, the small children. What was that? Satan trying to devour again that child. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Daniel chapter 7 that you need to understand who he is. That's the son of man who comes to the Ancient of Days and rules. And that word rule is shepherds. He shepherds all nations with a rod of iron, God's shepherd. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne, the ascension of Christ. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and sixty days. How long's that? You guys are experts now, aren't you? How many months? Forty-two. Once again, please notice the dragon will come down in verse 14 and begin to persecute, verse 13 and 14, the woman. It's not Mary, it's Israel. Satan has been trying to attack Israel for a long time. But from Israel will come, as Jesus said to the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. Through Judah, through the line of David, will come the Messiah. And so the woman fled. Interesting, that word is fuego, to flee, to run away into the wilderness. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand. What did he say you should do next? Flee, same word, fuego, flee. Don't go down from the roof into the house, get out of town. Don't go back from the field into town, get out of town. Interesting, Luke 21, he said the same thing. When you see these things, flee, fuego, get out of town. And so this rise of the Antichrist, this battle that's coming, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place, note this, prepared of God that they should feed her there three and a half years. There's a place for her to hide. 
And there was war in heaven. Why? Because the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. So where do you got to start? Satan's power. There was war in heaven. By the way, interesting question. I wonder how much of this we see. Are we like, get him, get, you know, just curious. War in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against who? The dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Remember it said his tail drew one third of the stars? Most agree what we're being told is when Satan, Lucifer, rebelled against God and fell. When he did, he took with him one-third of the angelic host who had become fallen angels. We know them more commonly as demons. That's why when Jesus would come, for example, during his three and a half years of ministry, come to someone who was demon-possessed, they would begin to immediately cry out and and freak out. "What What have you to do with us, son of the Most High God? Have you come to torment us before the time? Because that demon used to be a holy angel who used to serve the Lord. And now here's the Lord down on earth bringing forth his redemptive work and then his judgment. Interesting thing to consider. These were once holy angels that have rebelled against God and they're now fallen angels. And he took one third with them. Now, simple math, that's two to one, Michael's favor. I like that. How many like that? I like that. Two to one. Note the next thing. There was war in heaven. It doesn't say Jesus and his angels fought, does it? It doesn't say the father and his angels fought, does it? Who fought? Michael. Who's Michael? The archangel. Please understand, Satan is powerful, he's evil, and he's determined. No two ways about it. But he's no match for God. He's just a created being. Yes, powerful. Yes, supernatural. Yes, all these things. But he's just a created being. A created being cannot possibly defeat the creator. It's not going to happen. Sometimes when we get into spiritual warfare, we we think as though Satan's going to overwhelm God. Are you kidding me? When it comes time to throw him out of heaven, Michael and his angels handle it. Don't forget that. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. By the way, Daniel talked about this. Let's go look at it. Daniel chapter 11. Left turn, Daniel chapter 11. Just after Ezekiel. Chapter 11, from verse 1 through 35, there are 135 prophetic statements, history in advance, made by Daniel, covering a 400-plus year period, that were 100% fulfilled. So much so that the liberal scholars balked at the idea that Daniel could have written in 539, because they said there's no way a person could know these things. They're right, but God knows, and it's God who gave to Daniel his information. If he gets 135 out of 135 in the first 35 verses, what are the odds he's going to get it right for the rest of the chapter? How many are willing to bet 100%? Me too. Chapter 11, verse 36, the king or the Antichrist shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation or the wrath or anger be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Remember, 69 sevens or 70 sevens are determined upon your holy city, your holy people. Till that that is determined be done. Neither shall I regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate he shall honor the God of forces. Verse 39 is going to do these things in strongholds. Verse 40, time of the end, the king of the south is going to come after him. The king of the north is going to come after him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships and shall enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land. Many countries be overthrown. But these, note this, shall escape out of his hand. Edom, what country is that in? Southern, eastern Dead Sea. Edom. Moab. Central, sort of southern, central, eastern, Dead Sea. And Ammon or Ammon. What country are we in? Jordan. Jordan is going to somehow escape during this time of these battles. Well, what's so important about that? A place 
was prepared for the woman to flee. Hmm, what's close to Israel? What's literally next door to Israel? Jordan. If you're in Bethlehem, for example, or outside of Jerusalem, looking in Bethlehem at the hills, you can go there, turn left, look this way, and you'll see the mountains of Moab. You can get there by foot. It's going to be a tough journey, but you can do it. Especially if you're being persecuted, you'll find a way. You can do it. So Daniel lets us know what seems to be the place that's prepared for Revelation 12. It's like you need both books to understand it. Just like we needed Genesis. Because it's one book. So these places will escape. Edom, Moab, and Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries. The land of Egypt shall not escape, so don't go south. Just a hint. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans. The Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings of the east, remember that 200 million man army? Tidings of the east and of the north will trouble him. Therefore shall he go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make a way. He shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end. None shall help him. Note this. At that time shall Michael stand up. There was war in heaven. Chapter 12 of Daniel overlays chapter 12 of Revelation. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble, I'll say, such as never was since there was a nation. Jesus called it great tribulation. Even the same, or at that same time, thy people, Israel, shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. How do you get in the book? Lisa phone. No. How do you get in the book? A buzz among the sheep. You mean if somebody stops you in the street and says, hey, I've heard about this book of life. How do I get in the book? You can't help them. How do we get our names written in the book of life? We receive Jesus as our Savior by faith. Remember when the disciples came back, he said, don't rejoice that the demons were made subject to you. Rejoice rather in this, that your names are written in heaven. Why are their names written in heaven? Because they've received Jesus. We get into the book of life by accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior, by faith, not by works. We don't get in the book by a 12-mile pilgrimage on our knees. We don't get in the book by giving money or attending church. We get in the book of life because we've received the author of life, Jesus himself, by faith, as our Savior. Well, that's easy. Well, then why isn't everybody in the book? Because to get into the book of life, you have to confess you're a sinner. You have to agree with God that you're not righteous. Not only that, but you need to repent of what you're doing, turn away from it, and embrace his son. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, then you don't want to be in the book. Well, that's not fair. It's your choice. It's very easy. But yet sometimes very difficult. But note this. Every one that shall be found written in the book, listen to this. Many of them that sleep or die in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Why do they get everlasting life? Because they're written in the book of life. Some to everlasting shame and contempt. Why do they get everlasting shame and contempt? Because Revelation chapter 20 tells us the dead stand before God at the great white throne. The books are opened of what they've done. They consult the books, and then they consult the book of life. And any man not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Everlasting shame and contempt. Every one of us is getting resurrected. Whether, you believe, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, all will be resurrected. All will be brought before God. For those of us who bowed our knee now and confessed with our tongue that Jesus is the Messiah and received him by faith, for us it's unto eternal life. For those who've rejected Jesus Christ, they're going to be judged by what they've done, and then they're going to be forced to confess he's Lord, but it's going to be to their own condemnation that they've rejected him. And yet it was so simple. Please review here with me for a minute. Which one sounds better? A resurrection to everlasting life or a resurrection to everlasting shame and contempt? Which one's better? So then why not choose it? Just what is so good on this earth that would keep you from everlasting life? Well, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. 
They that turn many to righteousness is the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. It was too early. Seal it until the time of the end. How will I know it's the time of the end? Many will travel to and fro. Uh, That's here. Knowledge shall be greatly increased. Yes, it has. Look at our technology. By the way, these things, verse 7, will be for a time, times, and half a time. How long is that? Three and a half years. Back to our text. So they prevailed not. Neither was there found place any more for the devil and his angels in heaven. And all God's people said, Yippee! And amen. About stinking time. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent from the garden, which is called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Take your buddies with you. Yes. Pastor Chris... Why would a loving God create such a wicked devil? What's the answer to that one? You're going to get these questions in the street, I'm telling you. Well, if you say you believe in a God of love, why did he create the devil? Did he? Okay, let's prove it. Let's go to Ezekiel 28, left turn. Ezekiel 28. You get asked these questions, you know it. Well, if God's so lovely and holy, then what's with this devil? Okay, here's your answer. Chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. This is about the king of Tyrus. Keep reading. Say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up, or you are complete, sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were complete. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Could the king of Tyrus have been in the garden of Eden? No way. This is long after the flood, and the flood destroyed it. So we're not talking about an earthly king. We're talking about the power behind that earthly king of Tyrus, or the prince of Tyrus, and that is Satan. He's addressing the demonic power behind it. You were in Eden, the gar- and you'll see, he calls him a cherub too. No human being is a cherub, that's angelic. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Somehow his ministry involved music, pipes and tabrets. Some argue he was involved in the worship of God with the host of heaven. We don't know for sure. What's real clear is since Lucifer fell and became Satan, he most definitely uses music to bring preaching and praise to himself. For example, Rolling Stones, Sympathy of the Devil. Van Halen, Running with the Devil. I know I'm dating myself. Super Trap, Goodbye Stranger. They said the devil is their savior and they don't pay no heed. He's got evangelistic messages throughout the music that he inspires. Why? Because he knows it's a very powerful tool. There's a lot more modern stuff that gets into it quite a bit, but I'm out of that loop. What gets me is, you know, you hear people listen to classic rock. For me, it's like classic trash. Same stuff, different day. You know, it's been like classic rock from the 60s, 70s, now 80s, now 90s. Like, hello. There's the, and yet, you have the body of Christ. You've got great new stuff coming out all the time, praising God, new beat, new rhythm, fresh stuff. And, and your buddies in the unsaved world are still in the same dead rut. But anyway, all things are new in Christ. Pipes and timbrels. You were the anointed cherub. You were created perfect the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub, verse 14, that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You've walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created. And he's only created until iniquity was found in you. So did God create a wicked devil? What did he create? A holy angel named Lucifer, who was a cherub. What happened to him? By the multitude of thy merchandise, you have filled the midst of you with violence, and you've sinned. Therefore, I will cast you out as profane out of the mountain of God, God's holy mountain. I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire. Your heart was lifted up. Here's the root of the problem. Pride. Because of your beauty, you've corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. So I will cast you to the ground, and I will lay you before kings, that they may behold you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your traffic, which you've done, your iniquities, of your traffic. 
Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It will devour you, and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. And all the people that know you among the people shall be astonished at you, and you shall be a terror, and never shall you be any more. There's a day coming. Well, just what happened with Lucifer? You don't have to go there. I'll read it to you. Isaiah 14. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. Pretty easy to memorize, isn't it? So we need to go fall, fall back later and look at it. There were five things that Lucifer had said. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, who was created perfect? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars or the angel, uh, angels of God. I will be over them. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. Again, the mountain of God in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. Most argue the Shekinah glory of God. I will be above God's glory. I will be like the most high. How many the most highs can you have? One. Whose job does he want? God's. So apparently, perhaps in leading the host of heaven to worship God, he began to feel that he was the one that deserved it. And so he fell. Let's go back to our chapter. Now is the enemy cast out, that great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, verse 10, and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused him before our God day and night. Job chapter 1. Sons of God, angels, appeared before the Lord, and Satan was among them. And God said to Satan, Say, where you been? Oh, I've been traveling to and fro through the earth. And God said, Have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright man, hates evil, loves God. And Satan said, Does he serve you for nothing? It's because you've blessed him so much, and you put a hedge about him. But you touch his stuff, and you touch all that he has, and he'll curse you to your face. And God said, Okay, you can touch his stuff, but you can't lay a finger on him. And Satan went out and destroyed virtually all that Job had. And Job said, Naked came I into the world, naked will I leave, blessed be the Lord. And all these things Job didn't sin. And it came to pass a little further along, chapter 2 of Job. The sons of God again appeared before the Lord, and Satan was among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? He's still just and upright, a man who hates evil and loves God, and, uh, and stands in his righteousness, though you move me against him. And Satan said, Skin for skin. All that a man has, he'll give to keep his life. But if you touch his body, you touch him, he'll curse you to his face. And God said, okay, you can touch him, very interesting, but you cannot kill him. And he went out and afflicted Job horribly. Read through the book, by the end of it, you'll understand why a very difficult trial. At the end of it, Job came to a much deeper understanding of who God is. And would eventually say, I put my hand on my mouth, no further questions. Zechariah chapter 3. There, the high priest, Joshua, is before the Lord and the angel of the Lord, and Satan is there accusing him. And Joshua is in garments that are defiled. And so there the Lord said, take away these garments, put on him holy garments, a fresh miter. You know, in other words, restore him and redeem him, clothe him. Satan was there accusing constantly before God. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. Could you imagine if your name came up? Satan's after you? Oh, don't freak me out. Wait a minute. But what are the parameters? Nothing is allowed to happen to you from the, for the fallen realm, but what God will allow. Now, is God the cause of it? No. Will God allow it? Sometimes he does, like when David numbered the people. But what ended up happening? Found the location for the temple. These are things I don't fully understand. But I know who's behind them. I know the Lord is holy. He's right. And what is intended for evil, God will use for good. But there's a day coming when we no longer have to deal with the devil and be tempted and be, be tried by him. We'll be there without sin, without the world, without flesh, without the devil. You know, it'll feel kind of like heaven. The accuser of our brethren has been cast down before our God day and night. Interestingly enough, by the way, in Zechariah, he said, and I'm going to set up my servant, the branch, the stone upon whom has seven eyes, omniscience, and he will remove the sins from the people in one day. 
I'm going to send my high priest, my servant, my branch, my redeemer, who will have the omniscience of God and will remove all sin in one day. Who did that? Jesus. Zechariah 3. Go look at it. We don't have time to pull it off now. They, our brethren, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. Why? What does the blood of the Lamb do for us? Satisfies the wrath of God and pays for our sins. Yes? So if he's accusing us of our sins, but we've received Christ by faith, we're in the book of life, then we're under the blood of Christ, and so therefore our sins have been paid for, our sentence has been commuted, we're done, and we're in the righteousness of Christ. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The blood atonement of Jesus Christ has satisfied the wrath of God and the law of God, so by faith we can be right with God. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's where we get the power. The blood of the Lamb is what frees us from sin. Then the second part. And they overcame him by the word of their testimony. What's that? I'm not helping. What's that? What's your testimony? How you got saved. You ready for this? Boil it down. The word of your testimony is that you believe the word of his testimony. Do you get that? Your testimony is you believe the record of God's word, that Christ is the Savior of the world. So isn't that interesting? Because of his blood and his testimony, we've overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil by his blood and our testimony, which is we believed his testimony. Go home and noodle on that one. That's why you need the word of God in your heart. Because it's more of his testimony, which is more of our victory that has been won through Jesus Christ. The word of the testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And by the way, they loved not their lives unto death. Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for his sake and for the gospels, you will find it and be in the book of life. They loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Why? Because the devil has been thrown out. But woe. To the inhabitants of the earth. Again, here's our phrase, they that dwell upon the earth, always used to the unbelievers and used ten times in this book. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, the unbelievers, and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he just got thrown out of heaven, and because he knows that he has but a short time. I want to address the so-called Satanists. May not be here, but I'm sure occasionally they tune in. I'm going to just lay it out for you. If you think you're a Satanist and you're following Satan, may I point, just as clearly as I can possibly point out, you have made a decision to follow the biggest loser history has ever known. Call it what it is. He knows he's a short time. He knows he's not going to win. But he's so deluded, genius bordering insanity, that he's still going to go for it. You are following the greatest loser human history will ever know. And that's rewarding? It's funny. They don't want to believe in God, but they say they believe in Satan. Oh, well, then where'd he come from? You're following the world's greatest loser. Jesus said as much in Matthew 25 when he separated the sheep from the goats. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Into the lake of fire that's prepared for the devil and his angels. If you reject the kingdom of light, then you're in the kingdom of darkness. There's no gray airlock between them. I was kind of in the middle. No, you're in one kingdom or the other. And death will fix you in that decision. Depart from you, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Since you wanted to follow that enemy, then share in his reward. The lake of fire. Does it have to be that way? No. Everlasting life? Or everlasting shame and contempt. When the dragon saw that he was cast out under the earth, he persecuted the woman. That's why it can't be Mary, it's Israel. Which brought forth the man-child. And the woman, to the woman, were given two wings of a great eagle. Some argue, well, is that an airplane? It'll be clear when we see it. But remember, in Exodus 19, he said, I led you out of, out of Egypt on eagle's wings, and yet they went on foot with a pillar of cloud, and a pillar of fire. 
could speak of protection from above. There's a lot of ideas. It will be real clear when it's done. Two great wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for time, times, and half a time. How long is that? Three and a half years. Great tribulation. Gee, where does she flee? Territory of Jordan. What stronghold is in southern Jordan, the land of Edom, that might be a good place to go? A city called Petra, or known as Sela today. How many saw Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? How many saw that? You watched that movie? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> you know when they rode into the place that was supposed to have the Holy Grail? They went through the, on the horses through those caverns? That's Petra. And that, long, that cavern is, is a very long one. Very interesting, very high cliffs. It's amazing. Very easy to defend. Unless, of course, you just drop a bomb in the middle of the place. But very easy to defend. There were tales in the 70s and early 80s of Christian businessmen who had studied these prophecies who had put stores of supplies of food in that city for the Jews who would be fleeing there. I don't know if they're still there, and I can't verify it. If you've got first-hand knowledge on that one, let me know. But this is an area that would be easy to hide in and relatively easy to defend, at least from a land assault, for the Jews. And it's right in the territory of Edom or Jordan, the city of Petra. So she has a place prepared where she flees. Again, this will all be clear when it's done, but she's there three and a half years. She hides from the face of the serpent. And as she flees, verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood, as a wings of an eagle, as a flood. Could be water. What else could come after you like a flood? An army. So if it's literal water, It'd be very easy. Note what happens. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. Why? The serpent cast out of his mouth flood as a water after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out out of his mouth. It could be a flood of water and it's soaked up, sinkholes, whatever, which are pretty fascinating. Or it could be the earth opens up and swallows an army. Oh, Pastor Chris, come on, really. You really think the earth would open up and swallow human beings? Well, do we have a precedent? Where? Korah's rebellion. Korah and Dathan and others rebel against Moses and Aaron. And so Moses said, okay, let's find out who's really in charge. If I'm in charge, then how about God does something different? The ground opens up and swallows all you people alive down to the pit. What happened? Exactly that. So whatever it is, It's going to help protect the woman, Israel, as they flee. This part of the remnant. And the dragon was wroth with the woman out of his reach. And so went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the remainder of Jews, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Chapter 12, again, is parenthetical. What do you mean? It's a pause from the action that we've been working through. We had that when we got into chapter 10, into chapter 11 up to verse 15, where we had these trumpets being blown, and then we stopped to just give some more information, chapter 10, chapter 11, the two witnesses and all that. Then verse 15 of 11 picked up again the seventh trumpet. We began to move forward. But then chapter 12, 13, and 14 are again parenthetical. What do you mean? The kingdoms of this world are now become the kingdoms of our Christ. So the author here, John, is telling us about those kingdoms. Number one, it's all based behind satanic power. Number two, in the last days, he's going to consolidate his power, next week's chapter, if we're here, in the Antichrist and the false prophet. These individuals are going to be used to deceive the nations and bring them under satanic control. In the time of that control, as it's being exerted upon this world, God is going to again warn people by sending an angel with the everlasting gospel through the heavens, chapter 14. Once these things have been laid out about this is the subplot of happening, this is how this kingdom got established, here's how he's going to try and go for it in the last days, then we again pick up chapter 15 and 16, our progression, where God again gathers them to Armageddon. So he's basically letting us know, here's how we got in this mess. And this is the mess that Jesus is going to finally destroy. But we'll have to pick it up next week, because we're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the warning of what's coming ahead of us. Israel's back in the land. Isaiah chapter 66, can a nation be born in a day? It was. May 14th, 1948, 4.30 p.m. Zechariah 3, 
the stone from God, the omniscient cornerstone, the servant, the branch, will remove all sin in one day. It was done on a cross 2,000 years ago. One day, the Lord will descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, be with the Lord in the clouds. Comfort one another with these things. One day. How soon these days are, Lord, only you know. But one day everything we've known is going to change. This world is going to go through a time of extreme trouble. Thank you, Lord, that if we soften our hearts and receive you as our Savior, we can have a resurrection of everlasting life. We can be forgiven our sins by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, believing His testimony. And that too comes in one day when we finally opened our heart to you by faith. Thank you, Lord, how you work in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.